This film will describe the North Vietnamese invasion of South Vietnam in 1972. The main thrust directed at Military Region 1, also known as i Corps, and the Allied response, consisting of solely South Vietnamese ground troops supported by United States air and naval firepower and logistics support. The major North Vietnamese offensive, beginning 30 March 1972 in MR1 of South Vietnam, was a campaign of intense warfare involving North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese troops. The United States provided air, naval, and logistics support in an operation not involving United States troops other than advisors and liaison teams on the ground. In the campaign, U.S. forces provided close and direct air support, naval gunfire support, amphibious and helicopter lift, command, control, and communication support, and intelligence support. This campaign saw the introduction of new types of weapons and tactics, had lessons relearned, and raised pertinent issues for future planning. Because the North Vietnamese resorted to open, conventional offensive battlefield tactics facing only South Vietnamese forces, the 1972 conflict was described as a wholly new war within a war, one that was a decisive challenge to the U.S. doctrine of indirect, specialized support to a client state. During the three years following the 1968 Tet Offensive and the U.S. bombing halt, United States naval forces maintained strength and continued their operations, mostly in the form of close and direct air support and interdiction and armed reconnaissance in Laos and Cambodia. Naval surface forces continued market time, game warden, sea lord, and riverine operations into 1969. A gradual U.S. troop withdrawal was coupled with attempts, by means of the Paris talks and secret diplomacy, to negotiate an end to the conflict altogether. Well, there were also changes underway in the communist world during this three-year interlude. The troubled relations between the Soviet Union and communist China, Hanoi's principal supporters, further deteriorated perhaps affecting their commitment to the North Vietnamese cause. In North Vietnam, there were also new developments, but little change in Hanoi's determination to continue the war. The communists had suffered huge losses during their Tet Offensive, and afterwards, their legendary leader for over a quarter century, Ho Chi Minh, died. However, the emerging North Vietnamese Politburo saw the protracted bombing halt as an opportunity to rebuild their army and map plans for still another offensive. Emboldened by new material support from the Soviet Union and China, and apparently miscalculating South Vietnam's strength and America's resolve to support its ally, North Vietnam prepared for a dramatic military departure in its long effort to control Indochina. For Hanoi, 1972 was to be the year of triumph in its so-called War of National Liberation. The comparative quiet of the preceding three years ended explosively in the pre-dawn hours of 30 March 1972, when the North Vietnamese Army launched a massive invasion of the two northernmost provinces of South Vietnam's Military Region 1. This invasion force consisted of the equivalent of 17 infantry regiments, three artillery and rocket launcher regiments, and two armored regiments. Coordinated attacks by fire were directed at all South Vietnamese strongholds in the DMZ, fire support bases in Quang Tri province, and the base at Dong Ho. Operation Nguyen Wei, as Hanoi called it, was the start of a countrywide offensive that soon engulfed the central highlands around Kon Tung, the Cambodian border, and Anh northwest of Saigon. This film will deal exclusively with the campaign and MR1, 
scene of the communists' most important spearhead and where most of the United States Navy's operations in South Vietnam were concentrated. From the initial artillery barrage onward, the invasion intensity and sophistication of attack patterns indicated that this was an entirely new war. Their tactics were no longer traditional small-scale guerrilla skirmishing, but rather Soviet-styled open conflict employing several divisions with subordinate regiments in conventional one-up and one-back dispositions. Attacks were made by troops equipped with the latest of Soviet-designed small arms and supported by armored personnel carriers and tanks. A heavy volume of pre-targeted fire, including 130-millimeter guns, generally placed beyond reach of counter-battery fire, supported both offensive and defensive operations. The North Vietnamese employed combined tank infantry attacks, supported by artillery and mortars on the forward South Vietnamese position. And, significantly, the enemy deployed increased anti-aircraft guns as well as missiles well forward and in depth, 12.7 and 23 millimeters forward on mobile mount, 37 and 57 millimeters placed on successive lines in depth to protect command points, lines of communication, and assembly areas, and 85 millimeters and SAMs were employed in the rear area. The United States and South Vietnam had smelled an offensive brewing and took preemptive action against it in early 1972. South Vietnamese troops staged disruptive operations against enemy concentrations north of Saigon and in Cambodia. And airstrikes, including B-52 raids, rose substantially in the first quarter of the year. Now, these operations probably did delay the expected offensive beyond the Tet holidays in February. However, United States intelligence had not accurately forecast the direction, timing, or scope of the North Vietnamese offensive. The consensus all along was that the enemy aimed to strike across the central highlands of MR2 and cut South Vietnam in half. But as it turned out, his main efforts focused on Hue. In MR1, the communists were expected to try to seize a few outlying fire support bases for psychological value. No one anticipated the classical combined arms blitz with artillery, armor, and infantry. The most profound intelligence surprise was the unprecedented provision by North Vietnam of extensive and intensive air defense protection for its field forces fighting in South Vietnam. The earlier allied Lam Son spoiling operation into Laos had encountered similarly formidable firepower, but the logical deduction that this advanced military muscle would find its way into the coming offensive seemed not to be made. To counter North Vietnamese troop concentrations and equipment flow, U.S. air power was required to support South Vietnamese forces with close air support sorties conducted while opposing troops were in contact, direct air support directed against enemy troops in the general area but not in contact, and interdiction missions. Initial U.S. Navy CVA-based tactical aircraft augmentation was achieved by directing the carriers Kitty Hawk and Constellation to the South China Sea, where they joined the Hancock and Coral Sea, and deploying the Midway from the United States some weeks earlier than had been scheduled. Thus, Navy tactical air assets in the South China Sea increased by 130% during April. The U.S. Marine Corps deployed two squadrons of F-4s to Da Nang on 8 April to bring its assets up to about 30 aircraft. The first casualties of the Communist invasion thrust were, of course, the outlying fire support bases and camps. Within three days, the South Vietnamese lost the bulk of their artillery. Bad weather during these first days of the invasion prevented many airstrikes by visual flight rules, or VFR, from Task Force 77 carriers. During this critical time, 
several U.S. destroyers provided valuable backup as sea-based artillery. They were directed by a United States Marine subunit to the 1st Air Naval Gunfire Liaison Company, Anglico, headquartered at I-2 Combat Base with other U.S. advisors. A gunfire spot team was located at Fire Support Base A-2, and other members of the team were located at the town of I-2. By mid-April, when the weather cleared up, U.S. TAC Air was averaging several hundred VFR attack sorties a day, concentrating mainly west and north of Quang Tri City and around Fire Base Baston, which guarded the enemy's traditional route from Laos through the Achao Valley and thence to Hue. By the fourth week, the North Vietnamese Army captured both Dong Ha and Fire Base Baston. Quang Tri City fell on 1 May, and all that blocked the North Vietnamese advance on Hue was a South Vietnamese Marine Brigade. Through the campaign, the United States Marine Corps Air and Naval Gunfire Liaison Company directed timely and powerful, though not precisely measurable, naval gunfire support, usually in concert with airstrikes and artillery. A significant increase in naval gunfire support was noted after the arrival of the USS Newport News, the Navy's only ship with major caliber guns. On 2 May, the North Vietnamese concentrated their armor and infantry for a decisive drive on Hue. The South Vietnamese Marines withstood the intense artillery barrage and managed to wipe out several oncoming tanks. Using the burning hulls of the tanks as orientation, a ground-based American Marine advisor fed directions to the forward air controller orbiting overhead. Sac Air, now employing the paved nail designated laser-guided bomb, destroyed the remainder of the tank. Separated from their armor, the advancing North Vietnamese infantry was then shattered by Sac Air strikes, together with naval gunfire and artillery. Largely because of the threat of this combined firepower, never again would the North Vietnamese Army concentrate its forces to such a degree in its drive on Hue. It was one of the many instances during the MR1 campaign illustrating how potent air support can be in inhibiting the enemy's ability to amass forces along the forward edge of the battle. However, throughout the summer of 1972, the substantial North Vietnamese air defenses, now bolstered by the SA-7 Grail, a man-portable, infrared guided anti-air missile, posed a serious threat to Allied aircraft, restricting modes of air operation, making them less effective. This increasingly hostile air defense environment forced the forward air controllers, or FAC, above their accustomed 400 to 900 meters AGL to nearly 3,000 meters, compromising their capacity to acquire targets. The improved air defenses also posed an increased hazard to attack aircraft, making low and slow bombing runs. The A-1, for example, that had been flown with such accuracy against armored vehicles during the April battles, proved quite vulnerable in this new environment it became necessary to employ high-performance aircraft in the delivery of such soft battlefield mainstays as Snake Eye, Retarded Bombs, and Napalm, which must be released below 900 meters for accuracy. Helicopter assault, long accustomed to a controlled environment with an altitude of 1,000 meters, were forced by the more sophisticated air defenses to now operate along the map of the Earth, thus exposing them to a range of small arms fire. Air support in darkness and in bad weather was also severely degraded. During the first two weeks in April, the blanket of northeast monsoon weather convincingly demonstrated that the United States did not possess an all-weather close air support capability that could survive in a hostile battlefield air defense environment. U.S. all-weather systems displayed serious limitations. For example, 
The Air Force Spectre gunship had beaconing system reliability problems and proved too vulnerable. And the A6A airborne moving target indicator required low, vulnerable flight profiles. Throughout May, the North Vietnamese made repeated major efforts to break South Vietnam's defense line along the Mechon River north of Hue, using a multi-battalion force backed up by armor and artillery. At each time, they were repulsed and counterattacked by the South Vietnamese, supported by tank air and naval gunfire. One of several successful spoiling attacks behind the line involved a combined helicopter amphibious assault. Two battalions of South Vietnamese troops were carried by U.S. Marine Corps helicopters, and one battalion came across the coast in U.S. LVPT-5. By the end of May, the psychological and material initiative was shifting to South Vietnam and its American allies. At a cost of thousands of troops, weapons, and armor, North Vietnam had failed to breach the Hue defenses. Throughout June, South Vietnam readied for a counterattack to retake Quang Tri City and hopefully the DMZ. And on 27 June, Saigon's forces swung over to the offensive. As part of the operation, Another large helicopter assault involving over a thousand South Vietnamese Marines was launched, requiring the helicopters and amphibious shipping of two United States Marine Air units in support. The North Vietnamese troops offered little resistance overall, and by the first week, all of the preliminary objectives were achieved, short of Quang Tri City itself, which the communists appeared ready to abandon. And then the South Vietnamese made a critical error. They decided to pause and would try to seize the city only after a careful and extensive fire plan was drawn up. Now this hesitation cost the South Vietnamese their momentum and allowed the North Vietnamese to organize a die-hard resistance. It also revealed a chronic tendency of the South Vietnamese commanders to call in airstrikes precisely because they were so easily summoned and were often effective. Nearly two weeks of bitter ground fighting, supported by massive VFR attack air support, artillery, and naval gunfire, were needed before the South Vietnamese could break the enemy's Quang Tri defense line and pave the way for the eventual capture of Quang Tri City. And finally, after a grinding war of attrition throughout the summer, two brigades of South Vietnamese Marines seized the Quang Tri Citadel on 16 September. They were backed up by an in-depth fire barrage, including 883 U.S. TAC Air sorties. And within a few days, most of the city, if not the province of Quang Tri, was secure. It is difficult to relate the activities and troop movements of the enemy directly to the close air support sorties flown by the United States and South Vietnamese air forces, as well as naval gunfire support. However, it would seem that the thousands of sorties flown throughout the year, especially those coming during the critical months of April and May against enemy positions in South Vietnam, contributed substantially to halting the North Vietnamese advance. Still in all, in the campaign's final week, in spite of the fact that the Allies enjoyed substantial firepower superiority and were using four dedicated forward air controllers over the forward edge of the battle area, North Vietnam was able to stymie the progress of some of South Vietnam's best troops for well over two months. But beyond mere exchange ratios between offense and defense generated from the MR1 campaign, there were important lessons learned and issues raised for future applications. One, despite a sophisticated intelligence and surveillance capability and several indicative clues, United States and South Vietnamese commanders did not accurately perceive the direction, nature, and timing 
of the forthcoming North Vietnamese offensive. The result? The surprise compounded into shock during the first days of the invasion. The main attack across the DMZ, a departure from the long-standing North Vietnamese strategy of severing South Vietnam by a thrust across MR2 from the Central Highlands, was not anticipated. Nor was their shift from guerrilla tactics to combined arms warfare. The lesson has to be relearned throughout military history that preconceived notions about enemy intentions must not be allowed to influence the interpretation of intelligence and the selection of courses of action. Two, because it was easily summoned and often effective, South Vietnamese commanders became somewhat addicted to the use of tack air. Their tendency to call in air strikes caused them to lose momentum and initiative at critical points in their counter-offensive to retake Quang Tri City. Tack air does not substitute for leadership and initiative on the ground and is limited in compensating for other shortcomings in forces. Three, naval gunfire support provided a vital backup as sea-based artillery during the critical first days of the offensive when South Vietnamese forces lost more than two-thirds of their artillery and weather precluded most pack air support. In a sophisticated air defense environment, as suggested by the North Vietnamese invasion force, will close and direct air support be significant factors in the outcome of the battle? What kinds of systems can be developed to acquire and designate battlefield targets in the presence of highly capable air defense? What kinds of systems will be available to allow effective air support in darkness and bad weather? The profusion of battlefield guided weapons that the MR1 campaign portends, how will it affect the future of helicopter and amphibious assault operations against enemies similarly equipped? Are profound changes in the TONE of the Marine Corps indicated? And in view of the demonstrated effectiveness of naval gunfire delivered during conditions when appropriate aviation assets were unavailable or ineffective due to weather, is a low priority accorded naval gunfire capability on new ship construction appropriate?